Hey, tribe of journeymen and women. Give me a sec, I'll take off this mask and we'll get into a subject which is gonna be really interesting. We're gonna do it on our favorite bench, by the way, in our nice location. But that aside, uh, the story we're about to go into is digging down into understanding Aikido's philosophy, which is a worthwhile subject already. I think, honestly, I think it's, um, it's actually a great philosophy and uh, there's a lot of nice ideas in it. But as everything, it also has a dark side. And if you hang out in doing something for long enough, you usually bump into the dark sides. So you usually start to reach the limitations of that aspect. And that definitely helped. It happened to me with Aikido. If you know my background, you probably know a lot about it. But usually when I talk about Aikido, I talk about um, the technical side of it, like, uh, you know, the hierarchy structure and how it pollutes the dynamics in a community and the abuse of power by instructors and the lack of critical thinking and pressure testing. So all of that, it's more on a technical level. And it's been a while since I actually spoke about what specifically the Aikido philosophy is. But again, while, oh, somebody's attacking me. But again, while it, there's a lot of awesome stuff in the Aikido philosophy, which I'll be actually enthusiastic to share because as I said, it's been a long time since I spoke about it. At the same time, there are, uh, I think, personally, I think Aikido fails in delivering that philosophy, in living up to what it's supposed to be. And there are good reasons for why it fails. So if you're interested to learn all about that, stay tuned for this episode and let's get going. <laughs> so in order to understand the Aikido philosophy, first of all, um, it's important to know at least a little bit about the history of Aikido, or more specifically, the history of Aikido's founder, who kind of created the whole philosophy and, uh, and eventually it started to kind of become very confusing because of certain aspects, but that's down the line. Uh, initially, everything started from more Hiroshiba. And uh, uh, now I do need to say that more Hiroshiba is uh, he's one of those characters, one of those figures in history where he was uh, apparently able to do some things which other people weren't able to do, like he was stronger than others or he, he was able to do some kind of tricks which seemed supernatural. And I think when that happens, when you have that kind of legendary status, and especially since also you're involved in spirituality, which he was, he was, he was you could say, very spiritual, basically you could say also religious, uh, but then when you have that combination, usually it happens so that those people get tied, like flies are attacking me today. What the heck is this? So um, usually what happens is you become tied with a whole mythology or people, when you reach, reach that kind of living legend status, uh, stories about you start to surface, which are, most of them are not true, but they get passed around you know, maybe some part of it was true and they get expanded like, you know, I caught this big fish and you expand the fish, kind of the same dynamics. And the same, I believe, happened with Morihiroshiba. And it, there's actually a funny story. Uh, I had already, I went through a personal experience of this. It was really crazy. But I'll give you a personal experience example so you would know what I'm talking about. Uh, so very, very brief reminder, I was a yoga Aikido instructor. And I would often be invited to schools to, um, because I, I'm, I, it seems I'm very, apparently I'm very good with especially teenagers or kids. I'm good at inspiring them, kind of engaging them. And so schools would invite me to talk to them and motivate them. And uh, I, I, was, I went to one of the schools, I think to introduce kind of Aikido or something like that. So I was dressed in my Aikido gi, you know, with the whole hakama and everything. It looks quite impressive. And um, the main teacher who was hosting me or welcoming me uh, when we stayed in the room, just her, me, and uh, my senior student who was helping me out, uh, she kind of came closer to me and she said, so will you be able to show us your magical trick? And I was like, what? What, what are you talking about? And she's like, I, he I heard 
that you're able to pass through a pen for a room without touching it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I'm like, I don't get it. Like, what is she talking about? And I start digging into what she means and I realized it was a misunderstanding because when I was uh, doing some projects in schools, there was one exercise, like a teamwork exercise, where I would take a bunch of kids and I would give them an exercise, uh, like a brainstorming exercise. I would tell them, you need to pass on this pen from one side of the room to the other without touching it physically with your hands. And so they would have to come up with creative ways, which one of the best ones is just gather a bunch of pieces of papers or notebooks and, you know, create this line and, and you pass it down. And, but so I tried to explain to her, I said, so that's what it is. And she's like, she's looking at me like, no, 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 I, I know. And she's like dead serious. It's like, I, I, it's like, like, don't, don't lie to me. I know, I know you're able to do that. It's like, so come on, will you show it? And I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, well, yeah, maybe not today. So basically <laughs> there was this legend in her mind that I'm able to pass through a pen through a room without touching it because it was a misunderstanding. But then, you know, she would tell that to others, obviously, and others would believe, some wouldn't believe. And then, you know, because I think because I was also part of that mythology of spirituality and martial arts and they're mystified often, I guess that gives a better gateway for these legends to spread. So it's crazy that I actually even went through a personal experience of bumping into that. Uh, but I'm dead sure that that's exactly what happened with Morhia Shiba. And there are a lot of crazy and interesting stories about him, like people getting knocked out, but just being touched by him and so on. And, you know, it's hard to say whether it's hypnotic susceptibility, which I made a video on one of my channel, in my main channel about that in the past or, or what it was. But I think it's like a mix of everything, mix of. Uh, unique uh, abilities that that individual is able to show, like kind of special abilities, but uh, but then mixed with all types of talks. So 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 when I'm going to tell that story, the reason I'm bringing this up is I'll do my best to portray a quick story of Mori Yoshiba, also known as O Sensei, the great teacher. But uh, note that I'm not like you know a history expert, and I dug into his history quite a bit back in the day. So I will probably portray it quite well, but it's, it's, it's also a mess of, you know, legends and stories and so on. So I'll just give you a brief introduction, but, you know, take it with a grain of salt. And some, some places I may be mistaken, but I'll give you the main essence, the main picture. So uh, what is important to know about the founder that based on his history is that from early days, he was inspired and enthusiastic about um, kind of the mystical or the religious, the, the supernatural, and he was into Shintoism, the, you know, uh, pagan tradition of, of Japan. Uh, he apparently was a very weak child uh, and very introverted, so he would spend time, a lot of time thinking and observing things around him, and based on the story, he that's how he got exposed to um, the whole spirituality traditions and rituals of Shintoism. And he became really fascinated about it. And later he picked up martial arts. And I think those two things always kind of went toe to toe in his life. Uh, he apparently trained a lot and became very, uh, uh, very effective, a very effective martial artist, very powerful one. Uh, his devotion can be seen by the interesting moment where he even built a house for a martial arts instructor, uh, Sokaku Takeda. Uh, descendant of a, of a samurai line uh, practitioner of uh, Daichiru Aiki Jiu Jitsu. And so he built, or uh, Morihei Shiba built a house for him and hosted him there and, like, I think provided everything for him just so he would teach him, like, uh, not Aikido, Aikido didn't exist back then, but the Aiki Jiu Jitsu. Uh, so you can see he was kind of very, you know, devoted and very kind of intense. There's a lot of stories about how he was like that. But besides him training martial arts, another significant moment in his life is that he met um, Onisabura Daguchi. It's been a while since I said those names, but I think I'm right. He was basically a cult leader, like a spiritual, religious cult leader. Uh, and he had his own um, religion. I think it was in Mo Omotokyo, if I'm not mistaking it, or whether it was, if it was another one. But I'll, I'll write it to you down somewhere. Not that it matters, I guess. But he had his own religion, which apparently, from what I gathered, uh, was aiming to unite all religions. 
But apparently it was like really spiritual. And there's this moment where they went to Korea, I believe, and tried to create this kind of spiritual hub, like an independent city, and they got in trouble and they nearly died. That's the moment where stories say that Morihiro Shiba was able to see, and I think that's how he perceives it himself, he was able to see bullet lines, like before the, sh the guns shot, and he was able to avoid those bullets, uh, and that's how he survived. And he would, I think that, that story is documented in one of the interviews he, he gave, so apparently he believed in it himself. Uh, interesting that, like a quick note, now that I'm looking back at that, it's been a while since I thought about it all, but uh, if you think about the theory of flow, and there's a great book about it uh, with a weird name. The name is The Rise of Superman. But it's a great scientific book about the state of flow like that. In deadly conditions, your brain goes into maximum capacity and it's able to do things which you normally wouldn't be able to. Like you, you perceive things in slow motion and so on. Like it's, it's a legit thing. So, you know, there is a chance that Mori Hayashiba he went in that near-death experience where he was shot at from distance. You know, he, his brain went into the flow state and he started avoiding those uh, bullets. Maybe, you know, I'm not saying like bullets, bullets. I think the way he expressed that story in one of the translations is that he perceived the lines of the guns that were aiming, where they, they were aiming, and he would be able to position himself like where he wouldn't get shot, which sounds more realistic a bit than dodging bullets directly. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, Maybe he did have some, some of these extraordinary experiences which made him even more into this mystical figure. But uh, one way or another, uh, eventually he got encouraged by his um, spiritual leader, Daguchi, to kind of continue to train martial arts, not to drop them, I think. If I remember well, but do correct me, I think he was at a crossroad where he was kind of considering, well, if I'm doing spirituality, maybe I should just drop martial arts. But he was very, you know, kind of proficient at them. so. So his teacher suggested him to continue on and he would teach, you know, the, the, the spiritual cult they had, martial arts. Uh, but a very significant point in his life aside that I, I consider to be is when Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened. You know, the nuclear bombs were dropped on uh, Japan. And uh, I think the story goes that he, that really impacted more Hiroshima uh, and it was interesting because I think there's there's kind of a dark side to his history that I think is not commonly spoken of, but uh, some people addressed that to me a few times and I got fascinated about it but never dug into it. But I think initially in his young days, uh, Morihei Yoshiba was very pro-Japan. He was very nationalistic, like I guess most Japanese. And, and he was all about, you know, Japan rules and let's, let's make this happen. But I think with over the years, he kind of became a bit more open-minded. And especially when Hiroshima and Nagasaki happened, he, uh, that really made him think, apparently, based on the story, that he realized that war is such a mass destructive uh, thing. You know, Second World War was happening over those years, and it ended with that note. And I think that made Hiroshima understand that if we will continue, like many people, I guess, that if we will continue down this road and if we'll have, you know, more nuclear wars, we're fucked. You know, humanity is not going to survive. Uh, that, that kind of relates to the quote from Einstein, I believe, which is a, a great idea. I think it's Einstein, if I'm correct, that he said that, you know, uh, I don't know how World War III is going to look like, but I know that World War IV is going to be fought by sticks and stones. Meaning, you know, the nuclear war will just blow away everything and then we'll have to restart civilization. So I think a lot of people were exposed to that idea. And uh, that made Oshiba kind of reconsider. So what the fuck is, what the fuck are martial arts for? You know, because martial arts, basically it's, you know, it's especially if we look at the old school days, which he was still kind of in the transition period between the Japanese, uh, the whole shogun state, you know, where it was all pro warriors and, you know, it was all uh, samurai and warrior class related. And then it, at, at his growth time, that was kind of changing into the modern civilization of the West world. So he was exposed to both. And he clearly he knew, you know, that the way of the warrior is basically the way of death. You know, it's, it's martial arts are means to kill, basically. And at the same time, there was Jigoro Kano, the founder of Judo. And he was 
struggling with the, from the history I know, he was struggling with the same idea, that notion that people were not so hyped about martial arts anymore, especially the Second World War, because that gave just destruction and, and just most people wouldn't relate to samurai. And uh, so uh, Jigoro Kano started to make it more ethical and kind of bring values into it and kind of bring a progression system to make it more accessible to people and to make it kind of a, a do, which in Japanese means the way, kind of a practice versus a jutsu, which is, means a technique. So there was Aiki Jutsu, uh, uh, but then uh, Morishi Yashiba went from Aiki Jutsu, he went to, there was Aiki Budo, but then eventually there was Aiki Do. Which basically, could, uh, there, it's, a, it's a tough way to explain what Aikido means, the name. And that's because Aikido, uh, Japanese language is like that. It's, it's kind of more intuitive or, or there's more meanings to one word than one. Uh, but some of the best ways to explain what he meant by... So I, it's, it's three words. I means uh, unity har or harmony or, or, uh, or Shiba like to say that, stress sometimes that it was, he would mean love by that, by the word I. I think he decided that later because love, actually, the I has a different kanji from what I know. But still, unity, love, connection, peace. Uh, then key is either breathing or, or kind of universe or energy. And do is the way, the path that you walk, the discipline. Uh, so if you unite all those words, many people like to make different interpretations based on what's most comfortable for them. But, you know, if, from what I learned about Warshiba and his kind of, the way his mind works, uh, I would guess that for him it meant more or less you know, the way of unity with the universe or the way of love and unity with life. Kind of, that, that would be probably the best direction. Or some people say the art of peace. I don't think that's fair to say, but you know, it's kind of a mix of all those uh, terms. But then coming back to his story, so I think he was already between that time establishing Aikido as, as, as Aikido, he transitioned into his own martial art, creating his own martial art. And after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, he isolated himself. He moved to Ibama, uh, a, a village where I think he bought some land or was given some land and cut out some trees and built a dojo where he kind of secluded himself and he devoted himself to perfecting the martial art of Aikido. And he would have Uchideshi living students who would travel to him and live with him. And that dojo is actually still there. It's called uh, the Ivama Dojo. Uh, long story, <laughs> another video. But uh, so he would be surrounded by students and they would work the farm and, and train. And he would travel and teach seminars, but he would always come back there. And uh, from what I understand, he was basically just uh, focusing 100% on creating this new form of a, of a martial art, which, uh, which was coming from the notion, the understanding that martial arts are destructive. And through Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the war in his life experience, he realized that destruction is not the way, you know, that it doesn't lead to real solution. And that's when he started speaking a lot about kind of unity and harmony. And, and uh, there's a, another significant moment in Washiba's life uh, which he spoke about as well, where he, apparently the story goes that he was facing a, a, a challenge from like a high-ranking army guy, I think, who was a swordsman. And the story goes that the swordsman was trying to attack Morshiba with his sword and Morshiba was just evading and he would see like, again, he would have that flow state, I believe like a deaf life situation and he had that flow state and he started avoiding all those uh, sword strikes. And uh, after he survived that, that battle, eventually, you know, the guy gave up. He sat down by, the, by a well and he kind of went into this unity state of kind of opening up. And actually, I have this whole video about that state and what I believe it actually means. It's called In Life Man Is Not What You Think. So check it out if you want to dig it down deeper into that subject. But basically, uh, since he had that uh, experience of unity, and uh, in that flow state, if you look at the science, it kind of makes sense because in that flow state, when you're in that state of unity, the brain part shuts down, which, which localizes you as an individual, as, as a separate being. It shuts down and then you feel like you're part of everything. And people experience that. It's not like an un uncommon thing to experience. And when many people associate that to be enlightenment. But basically that's what happened to Morihoshiba and he perceived that he's 
one with everything. And I think that drove him to understand the martial art of Aikido even better that he would, he actually started to perceive, and that's what he would speak about often, is that um, Aikido, or no, I say Aikido, but that we are all, or we're all one, kind of that Zen saying, that, that big Zen state, uh, phrase, that we're all united, we're all connected, that we're not separate, and that means that we're all, we, we are all one family. And, um, Basically, when you look at it that way, uh, and there's actually a great story, but I, I'm seeing that you know this video is already getting into 20 minutes, uh, and I've spoken a lot about Osensei's history. And what I think I'll do, I'll just cut it, make this episode into two parts, and I'll focus this one on Osensei's history, uh, kind of giving you a background of where Akito came from in my understanding and my perception, and then I'll dig into the main subject which I wanted to introduce in this episode. I'll introduce it in the next one about, you know, the whole, what, what the essence of Aikido is and why I think it fails to deliver that. It's a big subject and, and a worthy one to, to put attention in. But to just summarize the, the kind of journey of Osensi, more Hiroshiba. Uh, so he understood that we are all connected, we're all one. And, and that obviously made him question, basically. Like, so how do you practice a martial art, which is about destroying someone else, killing someone else? How do I practice it with that spiritual realization that we're all, all one? And that led him to create Aikido. He started developing a martial art, which he felt was uh, a peaceful way to end a conflict. That it's, it's redirecting energy and it's flowing, it's kind of uniting energies. And, and his idea was that Aikido, using Aikido, you would defend yourself and you would defend others without hurting them. Now that's where controversy hits, and you know what, I think I'll just, I got you probably intrigued, but I'll stop the episode here, you got the background, and I'll get into the controversy in the next one. Sorry for leaving you hanging here, but let's do it this way. Keep questioning, I'll continue in the next one. <laughs>